Now, if you have a problem with the plumbing, that's heart attack, that's angina. But as a result of that, the muscle may become very, very unhappy about life, or death, and the electrical activation of that bit of muscle may go wrong. And if that happens, you're typically dead in about six to eight seconds. That's how long it'll take. So that's a cardiac arrest. Good. Good. Yeah, I'm good, mate. I'm good. All right, Ready okay. to go. Um, oh, one last thing. Would you prefer heart disease or heart health? Any preference? A oh, heart health's awful, isn't it? Heart yeah. disease, dude. Yeah, so yeah. always. Well, kind of depends what you're aiming for, really, isn't it? As a cardiologist, you're going to be looking at heart disease yeah, and okay. treating it. Heart health is the preventative aspect to it, yeah. which okay. we do very badly. All right, good. That kind of, yeah. 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 All right, heart disease it is. All right. You were going for health, weren't you? Yeah, I would. I like disease, mate. Yeah, he loves a bit of disease, mate. <laughs> okay, uh, right. Welcome to the Everyday Perspective podcast. Today we have Dr. Ed Davies. Uh, sorry, again, one more time. I do this a few times. Do you? This is why you need me all night now, isn't it? Yeah, basically. It's yeah, 20 okay. minutes of chat and then me fucking up introductions. Yeah, it's fine. Minutes. Yeah, but that's what I, I kind of enjoy this part. Yeah. I really enjoy it because I'd never do it. Mm. I've straight out said I wouldn't do an introduction. In the infinite monkey cage, they would leave all of this in. Just say <laughs> To be fair, we have. We have. No, no, this we is have. actually a better we introduction. We have. We actually have. Like, yeah. On the first podcast, I drew a dick on this sheet when he went out of the room. Yeah. And he came out and opened it. And then he really enjoyed the, the dick, didn't you? And then. As I do. <laughs> As he loves it. <laughs> I'm made of, not made of wood, mate, am I? So. Um, yeah, I yeah, so it probably will end up staying in. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Um, but I'll give it one more go. All right. And see if we can make it at least sound a little bit professional. <laughs> Welcome to the Everyday Perspective podcast. Today we're talking heart disease with Dr. Ed Davies. Ed is a consultant cardiologist in Plymouth and the lead author of the Cochrane Review titled The Role of Exercise Rehabilitation in Heart Failure. Oh, thank you very much, Paul. Uh, great to be here. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for coming in, mate. Um, and straight away, I'm thinking that some of our audience who probably don't have an understanding of medical terminology might have no idea what a consultant cardiologist actually does. Yeah. So... Would you be so kind to explain, I guess, your role in a nutshell? Yeah, okay. So a consultant cardiologist is the uh, doctor that specialises in anything to do with the heart. So broadly speaking, you've got two types of doctors. You've got physicians who basically deal with pills or do small procedures. And you've got surgeons who deal with big scars. That's the best way to think about it. So a consultant cardiologist is the person who deals with heart health deals with pills, deals with heart disease, and can do procedures to improve heart health and heart disease. But a heart surgeon, a cardiothoracic surgeon, is the person that you go to if you need a really great scar to fix your heart, in a nutshell. So you, so you do various different things within the heart, yeah. whereas other people might be more specific. If, if you're unwell... Yep. Uh, but I see you first. If you're, yeah, exactly. If you're unwell with your heart you'll get referred to a cardiologist. It's the cardiologist's job to work out what's wrong, try and treat it with pills, try and treat it with a procedure, and depending on exactly what's wrong with your heart, that I'm sure we'll get to later, you may go and see a surgeon. All right, okay. That's pretty good, yeah? yeah. That was a really... <laughs> yeah. and, and I guess in regard to, to level of uh, position, because people think doctors, but that's quite a wide range because you've got the five years med school and then you've got your multiple years of training. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so I guess a consultant, where does that sit in the hierarchy of doctors? Oh, it sits at the top, but essentially as it, in order to get there, you have to go, as you allude to, you have to go to medical school for a minimum of five years. Um, I smile because they've changed it all fairly recently, but you will then work as a junior doctor who have been in the press quite a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, that's pretty much half of the workforce and a junior doctor takes you all the way up from being just out of medical school to a very, very senior registrar. And a very senior registrar could have been in post for 12 years or 13 years or so. So these are in them in, in itself a very experienced doctor. And then the final step on the ladder is to become a consultant. Does everyone go through that journey if they stay? If they 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 if they go the distance, do they all become that? Or? Yeah, it, it's a good question. And the answer is no. Not everybody, but being a consultant is not for everybody. Mm -hmm. Because with, with being a consultant, you are 
legally the ultimate responsible clinician for that patient's care. And so being a consultant has a certain level of responsibility attached to it. And it also comes with an awful lot of managerial uh, roles as well. So looking after rotors for junior doctors, looking after the finances of the department, looking after the governance of the department. It's an awful lot of fairly boring, heavy work that isn't for everybody. <laughs> so some people say, look, actually, I really enjoy being a doctor. I like looking after the patients. I like doing clinic. I like doing procedures. But I don't want all of the heavy stuff that comes with it. So they become uh, various other roles like associate specialists or staff grades. Right. Okay. So they just don't basically want the shit, and they want to just carry on and just yeah, that's pretty just much look it. After, yeah, just yeah. look after their, their yeah, that's right, their yeah. patients and not have the responsibility. Yeah. And then diving off from there, uh, GPs will branch off sort of halfway along the training and go and do various subspecialty training in general practice. Uh, and the same with pathology. Pathologists will do uh, some you know basic training in hospital and then go off and subspecialize in that. So when you're fresh out of medical school, you've got lots and lots of different options available to you. It's really cool, though, isn't it, that you don't have to stick to one path. You can kind of like branch off as you go in yeah. and move in a direction that probably suits different personalities, well, I imagine. Oh, very much personality driven. I mean, I went into cardiology purely because I got on really well with all my bosses. In one, in, in, in <laughs> Was one, that literally it? No, no, no. That, that is genuinely why I, why I went into it is that I really enjoyed working with the team that I worked with. And I found, you know, when you're up at four in the morning and someone with a heart attack came in and they went into the lab to get fixed and the adrenaline that that brings you, uh, you know, it's quite an addictive role. But people find these sorts of issues with all the specialties, you know, orthopedics, trauma surgery, you know, definitely cardiac surgery. That's, you know, about as adrenaline driven as you can get. Do you think that's why a lot of people do it, though? Because, like, for me, I, I, I would... I'd really struggle with that. Do you know what I mean? Like having someone's life in your hands, you must have to be a real certain type of personality to be able to cope with that on a daily basis. I'd, or, I'd or say whatever, there's a lot know? of personalities for different roles. So yeah. definitely people go into a certain speciality because they're that type of person yeah. They and they enjoy that sort of work. So someone who does rheumatoid medicine, for example, it's a very cerebral uh, specialty to do it's not for everyone it's definitely not for me you have to think far too much and know <laughs> yeah. too much to do that kind of thing whereas I'm quite good with a, a knife and a wire and so cardiology is pretty good for me yeah I can imagine like if you're an endocrinologist and all the hormones and all the different things it's like you yeah. have to really and there's so many variables to you know autoimmune diseases and other other different things Absolutely. that you know it's kind of a bit of a minefield where I imagine yours is quite not cut and dry but effectively well, you can know your field and then yeah my, my job's a great job the, the reason i like my job is that i get a great spread of different types of cardiological disease so i get heart failure that's one of my hats heart failure is generally a chronic condition you you know you get it most people then live with it for a very long time and most people will die with it at some point in their life Whereas um, pacemakers, my other hat, is a fairly uh, fun, but you do it once and then hopefully if you did it right, it's done, fixed, and that's it, they're off. And then you have to look after all the software of the pacemaker. Okay, like hopefully you did it right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that a thing? Is it like you can't just fit it wrong or you can do yeah, that type no, of stuff? Yeah, no, well, you can have a complication from yeah. putting it in wrong. Is that just... just does that just happen? Does it? I don't. I don't know. Yeah. Well, when, whenever you have a procedure done in hospital, you you sign a consent form, and on that consent form will be all the things potentially that could go wrong. Well, everyone's human, isn't they? And you, you have, have to sign on the form, and um, you know, ultimately, that's statistics for you. Someone's going to have the complication. Yeah. Uh, so dealing with those complications is one of the. That's probably yeah, a big part of your job at times as well, isn't it? It is, yeah. And, and does your role involve training other doctors much? It does. Um, so as a consultant, you've got registrars, you've got um, what we used to call SHOs, but um, sort of subspecialty training doctors, uh, and what we used to call house officers, so the very junior uh, people that are just out of medical school. Um, and there's a lot of training of that group of people now. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't, don't want to sound like one of those old people who harks on about in my day, but it used to be um, that you would have a consultant, a registrar, a couple of SHOs and a house officer in what was called a firm. And that was almost like, a, a you know, a firm was a company and it was a group of doctors who knew each other very well. 
who worked with each other all the time. So your consultant was your boss. If you were the SHO, you went to your registrar and your registrar helped you with the issue. And if they couldn't fix it, it would go to the consultant. It was quite hierarchical in that sense. But you got very good training because each consultant built a certain professional relationship with their junior doctors and had a certain degree of responsibility to train them. It's like on Scrubs. Yeah, that is, exa- that, that is genuinely that, exactly what just it's watched, like. I've just watched it through again. <laughs> it right? is, it, that it's in not, to this non-related. <laughs> <laughs> we did, we watched it I through. I asked exactly, research, mate, yeah. when I watched Scrubs. Yeah, I watched Scrubs. But yeah. it is, that is exactly, exactly it. it, it? But now picture it that you don't know the junior doctor who's in with you, working with you. you. You don't know who they are. And furthermore, it's going to be a different person in two days' time. So mm, Yeah, that complicates things. So the, the relationship is completely broken. So the training becomes a little bit more spiky. Why have they changed to, it then? Honestly, it's pretty much all due to the European Working Time Directive. And the, the law came in. So, you know, in order to have certain rotors that work, there are an awful lot of rules about when you are allowed to work, how many hours you're allowed to do a week, what gap you are allowed in between your night shifts and your day shifts. And all of these rotors get chucked into a computer and the computer throws out whether it's compliant or not and you just have to keep tweaking it until it comes out compliant. That's pretty much how junior doctors wrote as a a designed. So you'll end up doing silly little things. You'll you'll do three night shifts, let's say Friday, Saturday, Sunday night. You'll then have Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday off. You'll be back on the ward Thursday and Friday. You generally don't know the patients that came in Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. You're just trying to catch up Thursday, Friday. Then you might do the weekend shift on the days. And then in order to compensate for that, you get the next week off. Was that brought in by the European Union? Um, Yeah. So now we've left. Are, Are we... Are we able to change that? <sighs> I know, I know. We're someone else about it. that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. now, there are certainly people in the NHS who would like that to happen, but in reality, I think we've gone so far, and the culture has changed so much that any attempt to go back and increase hours would be wholly unpopular. And there'd probably be a lot of people who would argue the other argument to say that it's not great for patient safety. Because ultimately, the thing that the European Working Time Directive has done is it's meant that junior doctors do get the rest that they certainly didn't have a long, long time ago. It's probably a good thing then, isn't it, that they do have that rest. But overall, it's overall it's a good thing. But I would say the experience of being a junior and the training that they get nowadays, to come back to your original point on whether training is you know is part of my job yes it is but in order to provide it it's really quite challenging yeah okay um so cardiac disease heart disease it's pretty big business right um yeah so we had a gp on i think sort of four weeks ago uh, sort of somewhere around there now um and i think we chatted on there that it was around 12 percent of all deaths in men yeah um somewhere around that region and i think across all genders, I think it it's makes up about a quarter of all deaths. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I saw one other statistic that basically, I think every three minutes, somebody dies from from heart disease. Yeah, that's right, yeah. And which means that probably throughout the duration of this podcast, 30 people will die of heart disease, which is crazy when you think about it like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but it'd be great just to talk the audience uh, through, I guess, the state of the nation in regard to heart disease and some of the, some of the statistics. Because I think a lot of people will live in their bubbles and not have an awareness and not be off checking out the statistics and and are probably unaware of the real risk around heart yeah. disease. I think I read the same one as you, but this is the British Heart Foundation fact sheet that I cunningly printed off just before I came out. <laughs> uh, and even more embarrassingly, spilt pizza on. What pizza On my have? way. Uh, <laughs> it was the Stromboli one, but it came with a lot of oil. Uh, the CNM, the Crosta Monica one. Monica is very nice. Is it good, is it? Yeah, it's an oven job with extra jalapenos on it. How often would you recommend that pizza? I would never recommend that pizza <laughs> on this podcast. <laughs> That's what I like to hear. <laughs> Men stop eating pizza. But I, I did appreciate the irony that I turned up to this with pizza dripped all over yeah. my cheat yeah. sheets. Yeah. I, I assumed it was coffee. I assume like PTs, doctors need caffeine just to get they, they, they have a lot of caffeine, but we'll come on to that in a little bit. The virtues of caffeine. This tells us that 375 people will die today from circulatory disease, which is an incredible statistic, really. In the UK? In the UK. Uh, That's not even in the UK, that's England. Oh, just in England? That's just England. Uh, 100 of them will be under the age of 75, 
which would then be the termed premature because you're not really supposed to die in this country younger than 75 nowadays. 6.4 million people are living with heart or circulatory disease. And that's pretty much what you're saying. There's about 10 or 12% of the population. 230 hospital admissions due to a heart attack today alone. 230 heart attacks coming into hospital just today. And 145 people will die of it. That's a lot of people. Those are big numbers. That's yeah. a lot of people. So with regards to the amount of people that are going in and the amount of people dying, yeah, is, it, is that just because of, you know people get into the hospital in time or is that just is that well a huge factors like you know just how far your gone average they might be? heart attack so i don't know what your audience know about the heart but let, let's start right back at the beginning yeah. and say what is heart disease yeah the way i tell patients to think about it is think about it like this room okay that's your heart you've got the walls which are the structure, that's the muscle of the heart. You've got the doors, which are the valves. They let blood in and out. And just like any valve anywhere, it's supposed to open and close. That's its only job. And when it closes, it's supposed to stop stuff going the other way. There are four valves in the heart, and I'll bore you with them later if you want me to. You've got arteries on the outside of the heart. Now, that's the plumbing of the heart. In order to give the heart, which is a muscle, its only job to do is contract and relax. That's all it does. But in order to do that, it needs blood to get to it. And that blood is supplied by arteries. And there are three main arteries. Your heart sits there. There are three arteries that sit on the outside of the heart. Okay, those are your coronary arteries. And if those get blocked, they will cause a lack of blood getting to the muscle downstream from the heart. And if you get a lack of blood, blood getting to the muscle that's a bad thing that causes angina if it's a chronic condition and the artery doesn't block off completely or if it blocks off completely and it starves all the muscle downstream of blood that's a heart attack and it's the heart attack that causes that bit of muscle to scar and when it scars it won't contract it won't act as a pump anymore it'll just be a static piece of scar that causes heart failure, and if you have enough muscle that has failed, you may well die from it. So that's kind of coronary disease. That's ischemic heart disease. In you nutshell. mentioned angina then. Yeah. What's, what's angina? Yeah, it's a good question. So if you've got an artery that's got furring up on the inside, what we call plaque, and it's just sort of fatty deposits. Basically, and it's the dirt poor, that you get in a poor drain. lifestyle and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. Well. There are four or five main risk factors for it. Being a male is one of them. Can't do anything about that one. What do you mean, just being a male? Genuinely, being a male is a risk factor for coronary artery disease. You're more likely to get coronary disease if you're male. Uh, being diabetic. Having high cholesterol levels. Having high blood pressure. Um, and being a smoker. And those are your biggies. So if you get coronary disease and you didn't have any of those that's just bad luck that's just genetics you're, you're just born unlucky you know your parents if your parents had bypass surgery when they were 45 years old you're going to get coronary disease almost certainly be on the lookout for it but if you're you know if your parents lived to 90 and died of cancer and you haven't smoked you're not diabetic your blood pressure is good and you're fit and handy you're going to be very very unlucky to get any coronary disease but anyway, building up of the plaque inside the artery narrows the lumen, the lumen being the bit down the middle. And when it narrows up, it reduces the blood flow down it. Now, that doesn't cause a problem at rest. If you're at rest, you're fine because your heart doesn't need much oxygen. But if you need to crank the rate up, so if you go walking up a hill, you're not getting enough blood to the muscle. And that hurts. Doesn't it directly hurt? But you will feel tight in the chest it feels like you've got this heavy thing sitting on your chest females say it's like wearing a very tight fitting bra some males may say that as well don't know <laughs> danny danny and all that yeah <laughs> got a lovely set of jugs mate <laughs> but angina typically comes on when you're exerting yourself and settles down when you rest now that's due to a lack of blood getting down an artery but not a complete blockage now think back to when you're a kid and you got a spot on your face and you burst the spot. Well, what happens? You get a tiny little blood clot sitting on it, don't you? That's exactly like a plaque. A plaque is a soft, fatty deposit with a skin on it. And if you're unlucky, the skin will rupture. And if it ruptures, you get blood clot sticking to it. 
And it's that blood clot sticking to it that acutely, which means, you know, quickly, blocks the artery. Now, that's the difference between angina and a heart attack. Angina is a chronic condition due to chronic, which just means a long time, furring up of the arteries and pain when you exert yourself or if you're unlucky at rest. So if they have on angina, yeah, then is there, are they allowed to exercise? Are they allowed to do that sort of stuff? Because yeah. like you said, like they, it gets worse with exercise. So I imagine yeah. they must have to be really the careful. Symptom, no, the, the, the symptom gets worse. As in you get the pain and the tightness when you're exerting yourself. But that's not a bad thing. Because when you're exerting yourself, you're causing what we would call ischemia. Ischemia just means lack of blood getting to an organ. And when you get a lack of blood getting to that organ, that organ doesn't like it. It sets off a load of hormones that tells the body to produce new blood vessels getting to it. Those are called collaterals. They're tiny, tiny little blood vessels. So actually, training when you have angina is a very positive thing. Because the angina itself isn't going to kill you. It doesn't it cause reversible? a heart attack. Yeah, it is to a degree, yeah. There's some evidence to say that very high doses of statin tablets will cause what we would call plaque regression. That just means the plaques get better over time. But ultimately, you're not after that. That would be great. That would be the holy grail of cardiology, but we're nowhere near that yet. Well, like just general like fitness, you know, eating healthy, Absolutely. all that type of stuff, like yeah, turning the lifestyle around with that, with that reduce it yeah it, well or cause less inflammation or I don't it, know. it causes it causes lots of things that will improve your heart health it improves the heart's ability uh to pump as an organ so that even if you had these issues the rest of the heart is well trained and there's enough reserve in the body okay. that's the way i would look at it that's the way i tell people to look at it yeah. but also exercise what, what does it do it reduces weight you know you're going to get thinner and slimmer when you exercise, your blood pressure is going to go down. The blood pressure is going to cause lowering your blood pressure has a huge effect on the damage to blood vessels or reversing mm -hmm. or stopping yeah. progression of damage to blood vessels. So, yeah, all of these things are very, very important. Yeah, and I think in addition to the exercise, there's, there's a few other things that would potentially, um, I guess, provoke an angina attack or, or symptoms of angina. I think from recollection, it's... It's the four E's I got taught. So it's the exercise, environment, so that would be cold weather, mm -hmm. um, emotion, so getting angry. Well, actually getting angry or just is it stress in general? Stress, it can. yeah. Stre stress, anger, anything that increases mm. your heart rate. It's all okay. about, it's all just pure mechanics, really. It's just blood supply down a pipe. And yeah. if you don't get enough, what's yeah. your fourth E? Eating. Eating. Yeah. So when you eat the, the so no pizzas, no pizzas. Um, I think it's <laughs> yeah, yet, yet. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's just to do with it where the blood goes. Obviously, when you're eating, it's, it's all going to go into your stomach. Yeah, if you if you, are, if you divert all the blood to your stomach, which you clearly do when you uh, eat a big pizza, yeah. then there's less to go to the heart. Yeah, one That's of the, the one of the questions that we've got for you later is is when should people seek help? And I guess it would might maybe make sense to do this along the way. So we've just kind of talked about a, a, a really. I guess, is it a common symptom of coronary artery disease, heart disease? Yeah, in males, yeah. males are more classic than females. It's, it, and that's not me being sexist. That is genuine fact that males present in a very typically obvious way. Heavy feeling in the chest. You know, they give a classic story. I walked up a hill. I can't walk as far up the hill now that I did six months ago. Or, you know, I'm taking the bins out to the end of the drive and I'm... Have, I'm getting this heavy feeling in my chest and I have to stop for two minutes until it settles and then I can do the same journey back again and then I get the heavy feeling again. That's, that's a classic angina attack for a male, okay? Uh, females present very differently to that. They might get jaw ache or toothache mm -hmm. or a funny pain on their right shoulder. Mm -hmm. it, it's all very different. Okay. Uh, is there any particular reason for that or is it just just well i would say women are awkward but no. <laughs> I, I, I don't think we really understand it but it is one of the reasons why uh, outcomes for heart attacks in females is so much worse than it is for males in this country is because they tend to present late because their symptoms aren't classic a man knows when he's having a heart attack because he gets a horrible crushing feeling in his chest and he feels like crap you know, you you feel unwell if this is happening the, to th you. the thing is like you said if, if a woman thinks she's having jaw ache it's like, it's a completely, you wouldn't think you're having a heart yeah. attack if you're getting a fucking jaw ache, would yeah. you, you know? 
Am I right in thinking if you've got diabetes, then the you may not have the pain symptom? Certain certain groups of people with diabetes don't get the pain so much because the, the they, they can get a bit of nerve damage yeah. as well. The autonomic system becomes a little bit desensitized is the best way to think about it. So they can get silent heart attacks. But lots of people get those. You know, some people don't get chest pain or chest tightness. They just get short of breath when they're walking up a hill. You know, I saw a patient just earlier on today whose only symptom of their coronary disease was getting more short of puff walking up the hill now than they were six months ago. And it's only because they do the same walk day in, day out that they knew about the symptom. Yeah, okay. So well, so definitely a watch out, I think, if, if, if maybe people are experiencing that for if sure. You, if you look back and you say, I'm really not as fit as I was six months ago, but nothing else has changed, I would say that's a sign that you probably ought to be coming to is see it, Is it within it. certain ages you think to check out or all ages? Like, Well, we'd used to say it's, <laughs> it, it, it's in just the elderly. You know, you'd say more than the age of 65 or 70. Then clearly you're more likely to get these diseases because, the, you know, you build plaque up over time, don't you? But we are seeing more and more young people. You know, I see people with heart attacks who are younger than me. You know, we had 30-year-olds in with heart attacks. Yeah. So, you know, genetics is a big player. Drug use is a big player. What, recreational or yeah. steroid abuse? Yeah, both. Both, yeah. Both, yeah. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, I can imagine, like, mm. people with a just, yeah, rampant, aren't they? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and is, I, I know there's, you've got stable and unstable angina. Um is one worse than the other? Yeah, typically unstable angina implies that you're getting some pain at rest. If you're getting pain at rest, that tells you that there's an artery that's critically narrowed that is occasionally tending to almost block off. Is that when they put like stents in? Yeah, you're getting very close to having a heart attack. Right. Uh, so a stent is a, is a metal, it, it's very hardcore chicken wire, okay? Right. Okay. For anyone who can see, it, it's like the mesh on this microphone. That's what a stent looks like, but it's very, very, very small. A big stent in our world would be three and a half millimeters diameter when it's fully deployed, oh. and and it and it goes in over a very, very, very fine needle and wire. So a, a stent is put in typically through the wrist. Feel where the patient's pulse is. Put a wee little tube in there. And the tube's what we would call seven French, so it's about that thick. If you can see, it's very small, just goes in your in your radial artery. Through that tube, you place a catheter. A catheter's about that long, and it's got a bend on the end of it, and you just keep shoving it all the way up until it gets to the heart, and it always gets to the heart. That People say, how, how do you know? absolutely disgusting, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I think it's incredible. Like, it, it, what, you think that's incredible? Yeah, I mean, the, yeah, well, it's amazing science, but just the person that's, that's doing that to me, <laughs> I'd be like, fuck it, <laughs> no. The, the first person <laughs> to ever do it did it on themselves first as proof of concept. Now, that's <laughs> no incredible. Way. That's incredible. Well, that, that's, that's, that, that's faith in that, your own that is, science. That's what I was about to say. That's yeah. trust in your own ability. Yeah, I saw there, somebody tattooing themselves earlier on Instagram, I think, and I thought that was bad enough. So that's a whole nother That level. is quite bad, to be honest, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so once you've got the catheter, it goes up and you, you basically poke it down either the left or the right coronary artery and you just squirt some contrast agent down there and take some pictures using an X-ray camera. And that tells you what the diagnosis is, by and large. And if the artery is narrowed, if it's obviously very, very tight, you'd get on and stent it. Maybe. We'll get back to that later. Yeah. Or if you're not too sure, there are ways you can assess it formally to see whether it's flow limiting and put a stent in. Or it might be that they've just got widespread mild disease or mild to moderate disease. All term different percentages of narrowing. Mm. Um in which case you might just recommend medical therapy. Go away, have some rehab, take some aspirin, take a statin, have some other pills to try and improve your health. Off you go. How, how effective is that, do you think? Like if they're at that early stage, you know, when they're on the statins. and Oh, very. And do you work closely with like a nutritionist or a dietitian and stuff like that? Because I find a lot of people obviously would be overweight or like, you know. You'd like to think we do, wouldn't you? I and would I think, love to I, think, I think, you, you, I think in an do. ideal world where... Do you just send them on their way at times? Yeah. Do you? Yeah. Do you not think there's no way that you could work with a dietitian or a nutritionist or... I don't know. <laughs> because it's money, is it? Yeah. It's absolutely fucking crazy, though, that someone's had a heart attack or near a heart attack or something like that. And you, you obviously you're giving them the drugs and the advice. Yeah. But then if they was, you know... I know someone personally who had a heart attack and then when he come out, 
I was like, oh, you know, what, what's the thing? And he got like a leaflet and then like, you know, he didn't have that sort of, um, you know, knowledge of what to eat. He said, oh, I'm just going to eat more salmon. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, all oh, right, how much yeah. salmon? He's like, well, I don't know. Quite a lot. Yeah, loads. Yeah. A lot of salmon. Quite yeah. Is it just to be fair, that's good advice. I mean, it's not, yeah. you know what I'm saying? It's not bad advice, yeah. but for him, like he was a bit overweight and things like that. So like, you know, he, he's not he's not aware of the amount of calories he should have a day to be healthy. He's not aware of his, you know, his macros is, is different. But I think that, but I think this is where cardiac rehabilitation programs play a part. So there's obviously some local provisions, Nuffield are just starting a program and quite often they're run with multidisciplinary teams that would involve an exercise professional, uh, a dietitian. Is that, is that with Nuffield, but do, do people on the NHS get that? They, they, they are, they do, but it's patchy. And right. it really depends on which centre you went to and what yeah. their program is. Oh, so where in the so in in the country you're yeah, you're based, yeah. basically. So Nuffield's program is is a is a free for all program, um, but it requires a clinical referral. But in addition to that, you'll have other local providers who will be doing community rehabilitation programs. Right. So there it is available, but the 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 varying levels of the quality that people get across the country is 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 huge. Um, you know, you've got everything from. I find that crazy. Like not like when we spoke when we spoke to um, uh, the other doctor about it, yeah. and actually it was Louisa, and we were say she was saying that in certain regions they don't have certain you know aspects of medical care and they don't have this and that. That that just seems mental to me, and I, I imagine people don't know that. No. You know, the general average person probably thinks everyone gets the same treatment and everyone gets the same thing. Yeah, I think I think less than fifty percent of of patients i think who have had a cardiac event go through cardiac rehabilitation is that I right i think Somewhere that's a fair there? summary yeah. yeah i mean there is evidence for people in rehab who have not only had a heart attack or bypass surgery but there's evidence to say that anyone who had angina and had a stent would benefit from cardiac rehabilitation but the the, the provision of that in the uk is very patchy mm. which is tragic really because we spend as doctors and you know, the, the NHS is driven by doctors and the, the thing that we're good at is procedures and drugs. You know, that's our thing. You go to medical school to learn procedures and to learn drugs or to learn how to, you know, cut people if you're a surgeon. But what you don't go there for is the rehab. And there's, a, you know, rehabilitation medicine in this country is very underfunded um, and, yeah, massively underdeployed, which is a shame because there's great evidence. You, you know, if you're looking for bang for your buck for this – giving someone loads and loads of drugs for the rest of their life or a well set up rehab program that ran for four or five months to motivate someone to do all these changes for themselves in the long term. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the evidence behind the rehab programs is huge, but they're just, they're just not very sexy programs to deliver. But you say what you're doing though is is brilliant because if you did if they did do that for five months say and everyone got access to something like that they would then save on like you said the the drugs and all the different stuff but then it probably save your time as well because they're not coming back to you over and over again or that would be a, a longer time until they're coming back to you you must see it all the time you must see someone send them on their way see them again three months later because they haven't changed their ways they don't know what they're doing yeah of course but the NHS is a you know, my view of it is it's a relatively short term gain. You know, you're, you're battling the next few weeks, you're battling the next six months. Yeah. Whereas what you really need is someone to take the long term view in all of these conditions. It's not just cardiology and rehab, it's every single condition. It comes down to education as well, though, doesn't it? Yeah, hugely, yeah. Just from well, the that's offset. entirely yeah. different. Uh, yeah, that's an entirely uh, different subject yeah, yeah, for you, yeah. isn't it? <laughs> yeah, quite. Yeah, yeah, we'll get you back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll go to that. I don't think you want me on education. <laughs> <laughs> um, so just just sticking with, I guess, some of the uh, heart disease types. Um, so obviously that was ischemic or um, coronary artery disease. And and just to clarify this, because this this wasn't something that I really ever thought about until I did a bit more studying around it. But this, just to reiterate, the, the blood supply to the heart doesn't come, well, it, it does indirectly, I guess, but it's not, it doesn't come from the blood in the heart that's being pumped. It kind of goes up the aorta and then trickles back down, right, into the yeah. coronary arteries. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Um, and they would feed, obviously, the myocardium, which is the heart muscle, yeah. which is obviously what makes it pump. And then you mentioned that, obviously, if there's a restriction in that, then eventually that, that portion of muscle can start to die. Yeah. And that's heart failure. So can you talk to us a little bit more about that? And, and also, uh, this is a, more of a question for me, but the, the actual definition of heart failure, because there's varying levels of uh -huh. heart failure. So <laughs> where, where, <laughs> yeah, yeah. We might be here a while, Paul. <laughs> okay. 
Go for it. Yeah, okay. So heart failure basically is what it says on the tin. It is a failing heart. The heart has two jobs, which is to contract and relax, contract and relax. That's literally all it needs to do with a few caveats. Now, if it doesn't contract as vigorously as it should do, that's now called heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Ejection fraction is our clever term for the percentage of blood that leaves the heart every time the heart contracts. You'd think it would be 100%. You'd be wrong. It's never 100%. It's usually around 60. 60 it's usually, yeah, for a yeah. male, it's 60%. That's how the heart is designed. Okay, The heart is not designed to eject all of the blood out every time a heart contracts. A 60% is your golden number. Uh, females, similar sort of number, maybe just a little bit less. Now, if, you, if you've had a heart attack or you've had another problem that has affected the muscle, and it's not just a lack of blood, there's lots of other things that we'll get to in a mo, that causes a problem with the contractility of the heart. So you reduce your ejection fraction. Now, for me, as a heart failure specialist, most of the patients I see have an ejection fraction of 35% or less or 20%. Or I had a, someone who was still working as a labourer on a building site who was at 10%. It was incredible, <laughs> this bloke. But it's, it's amazing how the ejection fraction doesn't actually clearly define what your symptoms are going to be like. So, you know, on one hand, I've got someone who's had the most unhealthy heart I've ever seen. This is a genetic condition, you know, he was born with it. Uh, but at down to 10%, I mean, it was terrifying to watch. Um, whereas I've got patients who are at 40%, whose life really is blighted. They just can't do the stuff that they used to do. Now, why is that? Is that because the, the, this bloke here has worked on a building site all his life and he's fit and he's, you know, robust and he's been putting scaffolding up and, you know, he's, you know, had a great reserve in the body so he can handle it. And maybe the person with 40% who's blighted now just doesn't have that reserve in the rest of their body. Who knows? But that's, that's heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Now, you go to the gym, yeah? I've seen you at the gym. I'm pretty sure you go there occasionally. Now, if you just do bicep curls all day, every day, at some point, you're going to look like Popeye, okay? I'll take my top off and demonstrate, but <laughs> I, it's a tight shirt. Now, that muscle gets big and it gets what we call hypertrophied. When it gets hypertrophied, it gets a bit stiff. It doesn't relax quite as vigorously as it should do. Now, if the heart contracts okay, but it doesn't relax as well as it should do, that's heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. It means it's still contracting. It's doing that job, but it takes a bit longer to relax. And if it takes a bit longer to relax... It takes a bit longer to fill up as well. It takes a bit longer to fill up. But as a result of that, it fails and you get shorter breath. That's your main symptom from it. Or you'll get swelling on your ankles. You'll develop a heart failure syndrome, even though the contractility of the heart is okay. What's the leading cause of stiff heart in this country of what we would call diastolic dysfunction? High blood pressure. What's the heart's job? The heart's job is to ju just to produce blood pressure and keep the blood going around the body. And if you have high blood pressure, the heart is having to work harder to do it. That's going to the gym and doing bicep curls. Over time, gives you stiff muscle. So blood pressure diagnosis now, you know, if you have high blood pressure now. What is high blood pressure? Just so people know. Because the I, amount of people I talk to that don't know what their blood pressure should even be. Yeah, they, they've just changed it. But generally speaking, uh, around 140 for the top number, which is your systolic. Do you, know, do you want me to explain what the difference between well, the two I, numbers is? I know, is? but systolic I, I, is when it contracts and the blood goes out. And All right, so if you, you, you've got a heart and the heart contracts and there's a valve there. Now, when the heart contracts, it pushes all the blood into the body. Now, if all those blood vessels in the body were solid structures, your blood pressure would go through the roof really quickly. And then as soon as the heart relaxes, it would plummet back down again. It's not how it's designed. All the blood vessels in the body... They're like balloons. They've all got some compliance, some elasticity in them. So when the heart contracts, it pushes the blood out into the uh, circulatory system. That stretches a little bit. Then a valve closes, which stops all that blood going back into the heart called the aortic valve. And then it's the elastic recoil of the blood vessels that maintain your blood pressure. As a result, you're going to have a top number, which is the, the peak when the heart's contracting, that's called your systolic blood pressure. And then when it drops down after the valve's closed, it'll come down to not zero. It'll come down to 
a healthy person, let's say 80 millimeters of mercury, and that's your diastolic number. Now you want both of these numbers to be low. You want so you want them to be at 120 and 80. Is that well? Like- 120, 80 is your your gold standard yeah, textbook healthy person. Ideally, less than 140 over 85 or 90. You know, ideally and, and 85 over, that, over 140 is hypertension. Yeah, yeah. If you're over those. It's difficult to diagnose because if you go to your GP, you get a bit worked up, you're in the way, you know, you've already waited several weeks to get to go and see your GP. Then you've then you've um, got yourself all stressed because you couldn't get parked. You've had an argument with the receptionist. You've made it into the GP. They check your blood pressure and it's sky high. Well, of course, it's sky high. So, you know, what do you do with that? Do you reassure the patient, say, well, you know, you've had a horrible trip in. Let's see you again in three months time. Or do you recheck it again in 10 minutes' time? But you haven't got 10 minutes in your consultation. So, you know, what do you do? Do you tell the patient to go and buy a blood pressure measuring uh, device from a pharmacy and check it themselves at home? I'd definitely advise that, (laughs) yeah. Yeah, but risking the patient becoming obsessive about their blood pressure and writing it down 10 or 15 times a day and worrying if a blood pressure goes over 150. So there's, you know, there's pros and cons of all of these different approaches. Yeah, I think um, with with the blood pressure, I had someone speak to me really weirdly today. Just come up to me and said, "Oh, do you um, is my do you think this is this is wrong with my blood pressure?" He says, "164 over 96, I think it was." And he was like, "And I was like, go and see a doctor." <laughs> and I was like, "I know he's going through like a bit of a hard time with his uh, yeah, he's, I think he's going through a bit of a separation, and he's in he's really stressed and stuff like that." But I was like, "Just go and see a doctor." He's like, "Is that high?" I was like, "Yeah, it's definitely high, mate." Like that's. You know, I mean that is high, and that is the right advice. He's only thirty nine, and you know, I was like, just go and see a doctor. Like, just make an appointment, go and see him. Like, don't don't wait because if you wait and that carries on for however long, you probably know more than most. But yeah. you know, how long? If he was at that sort of level, how long does it take for damage to happen? Yeah, but it's, it's good that he was aware of that because this is the issue with blood pressure, isn't it? On its own, it's not symptomatic, so people just have no awareness that their blood pressure is high. I don't know why he took it. I, I forgot to ask him actually why he took it because yeah, that's true. Because a lot of people, I, I do it a lot with my clients. So with my clients, if they're if they're especially with men and they're over forty, they're a bit overweight. Mm. They're you know they're not they're not healthiest when they first come to me. I always make sure like blood pressure you know sometimes they're getting to get their do their bloods and Mm -hmm. other things like that but i always make sure that their blood pressure is fairly okay Mm -hmm. and then if it's not i'll say go and see a gp yeah because i know well yeah how how serious it can be if if that goes untreated for long yeah i mean if it's somewhere in the region of 160 over 100 you don't want to be doing any exercise do you really so no yeah so yeah okay cool uh where were we i think i asked you about um you asked me about different types of cardiac disease and then we may have gone off on a tangent for about 15 minutes i love a tangent i I enjoy i love it honestly we we got to heart failure you were talking about ejection fraction oh yeah we had a we had a a, a chap on the building site with a 10 percent ejection fraction so you've different got you've you've got different types of heart failure in those are your two main classic types and then talking specifically about those with a reduced ejection fraction Commonest cause, damage through heart attack. That's your commonest cause. Then you've got genetics, what we would call a dilated cardiomyopathy. That's just an inherent, you were born with it, weakness of the muscle of the heart. Uh, is there some, any way to get that checked? Or is that so it's not worth checking? It would be worth checking if you had symptoms, uh, so sh- shortness of breath, or if you have a first degree relative. You know, if your parents or your brothers or sisters had a diagnosis of cardiomyopathy, then you should actually get a standardized letter from their cardiologist passed on to you telling you to go to your GP and have an ECG and an echo. And quite a lot of people I see, you know, present with just that. It's just screening because a relative has this condition and can you have a quick look at this one? And if they had something like that, is it like tablets from that point or is is there much you can do about that? Well, right, okay. So people with reduced ejection fraction... um, why did they develop it? Was it ischemic heart disease? Is it genetic? Is it related to toxins? You know, those could be medical toxins. So chemotherapy is is a big one. Uh, various types of cancer can cause it. And then there's lots of other weird and wonderful stuff that I won't bore you with now. But that's kind of my job is to tease out which one of those are. <laughs> now, depending on what the cause of it is would dictate what sort of management you do for them. But generally speaking, there are four or five main groups of tablets that we have nowadays. Well, I mean, we're really lucky. Nothing much happened in the world of heart failure until pretty much my last year of medical school, which was just about 20 odd years ago. Now, 
if I'd done my medical finals the year before and I'd said you should give beta blockers to someone with heart failure, I'd have got a rap on the knuckles and probably reported to the dean for being an idiot. And then a year later, this landmark trial came out saying, actually, it turns out beta blockers are fabulous for people with heart failure. They make them live so much longer. So now everyone who has heart failure gets a beta blocker if they can tolerate them. What did the beta blockers do for all the answers? Beta blockers work, or essentially speaking, beta blockers block the action of adrenaline. So adrenaline works um, to speed up the electrics of the heart. So you, you all know, everyone in this in the audience knows what adrenaline does because it's your fight or flight response, okay? Having a beta blocker blocks all of those actions. So it slows the heart rate down. It takes the stress off the heart. And there's lots of other weird and wonderful sort of uh, you know, test tube type answers uh, as to what a beta blocker does for the body. But basically speaking, by slowing the heart rate down and taking the pressure off the heart, they significantly increase your life expectancy and your quality of life if you have heart failure. That's the first group of pills. Second group of pills is what we call ACE inhibitors. ACE inhibitors, things like Ramapril, things like that, they're typically blood pressure lowering tablets, but they work by blocking actions of different hormones that the kidneys produce to improve the health of the heart. And then just in the last five years, there's two other classes of drugs that have come out that, again, have shown fabulous promise and potential for people with heart failure. So generally speaking, if you come in with a new diagnosis of heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, you get started on those groups of tablets. Sorry, just a quick one. Um, Mm. Telemartisan, is that a good blood pressure tablet? Uh, No, rarely used for blood pressure. Okay, just asking. What did you ask about that? Uh, Random. (laughs) Yeah, I know. Uh, so I know a lot of bodybuilders that use telemartisan to counter their high blood pressure when they take steroids. Right, okay. Just a random one for myself. Just So, uh, so, just so Ed, for the bodybuilders watching, is there a better one to be taking? <laughs> Please well, it's don't probably... take... Well, right, my, my formal advice is just don't take steroids. Well, they're, we, got, they're not going to listen to that and, one. And, yeah. and especially, especially uh, the testosterone uh, supplementation. I mean, we've had several people in the last couple of years with pretty bad heart failure as a result of those things what so, just just testosterone or just uh are they taking like heart hush or compounds would you not know what well, would you it? believe they're not very reliable historians when it comes to that that's what i was going to say yeah <laughs> so it's it's a it's one in it taking testosterone and there's another taking trend or something yeah. a lot harsher again we can go into that yeah, another yeah, time yeah, yeah. that might be a different yeah. podcast for yeah. you but yeah no I, I just thought i'd ask because i know like a lot of people in the body bodybuilding community take telemartisan if, because yeah. maybe it's easy to get hold of I've, or or whatever it is i would say but, it's probably relatively easy to get hold of yeah it is yeah it is easy to get hold of do, just just while we're on this tangent i do want to continue for a second yeah because i talking to a lot of guys moving into their 40s that there is a lot more um, I guess openness and a lot more blokes looking at things like TRT now. Mm-hmm. And you obviously have some endocrinologists who have, you know, sort of medically run clinics that are well governed and they'll look after you. But sadly, the reality is there are a lot of people who are just getting it Going from God knows where. Thing. Yeah. Um, so is there, is there like, even under supervised circumstances, is there a, a risk to heart health? when it comes to taking something like testosterone replacement therapy? Yeah, I mean, anything that increases your your blood pressure, which is one of the ways that the testosterone uh, supplementations affects heart health, anything that does that is going to cause all of the damage that that high blood pressure did for you, ultimately. Now, you can do good work by giving another drug, a blood pressure lowering tablet just, to counteract that, that effect. Just not, t- just not tell them what. Yeah, you could. I mean, you you can do that, but ultimately, you know. My, so what my, one should they take then? <laughs> no, my, the, the formal advice is I can't. I mean, I can't actually yeah, answer no, the no, question no, no. for you. The reason I can't answer the question is in order to answer any of these sorts of questions, you need data. You need hard evidence data for it, and you need randomized controlled trials to get that data. Now, do you know how much a randomized controlled trial costs to run? I one like one to, drug to answer a question, how much does it cost? I won't even have a clue. Have a, have a guess. A million. 10 million for a decent randomized controlled trial. Haven't they just finished one in the US on testosterone? I've, I've got to read it properly, but I'm pretty sure they've just finished In one order like to that. do one decent randomized controlled trial, the drug company that is trying to bring their new drug to market needs yeah. to be pretty confident that it's going to pass the test. And they need to be pretty confident that there's a huge market for it and that it's 
on patent. So they're going to get their money back because nobody wants to spend 10 million quid to then sell paracetamol to people with headaches. Everyone knows it works. <laughs> yeah. One of the leading drugs we use for people with heart failure is a drug called fruzamide. It's a water tablet. You know, We all know it's great for people with heart failure because you give them the tablet and all their swelling goes away. Right, but is okay. there any evidence for it? No, there's no evidence for it because it's cheap as chips. No one's ever going to do a it's trial. Do a trial on it, yeah, I mean, yeah. it's been around too long. You know, it's been around since the 1950s, 1960s. So no one's ever going to do that trial. Do you think if they regulated testosterone use or um, steroid use or anything like that, that they could have a bit more of a control on it? You you control everything by regulation, but in reality, people are always going to go and find it through the back doors. Yes. But maybe if it was more accessible to people, like in general because i think in the uk obviously we've got the nhs and then if someone wanted to go and use testosterone or their their hormones weren't quite right it's it's probably really hard so say like poor uh, it's, it's 45 um I'm, in, I'm not 45 no, by the way surely not <laughs> in five years by the way he's 45 but in 45 say his testosterone levels really dropped and then he's at a point like oh i'm feeling sluggish i'm feeling this i'm feeling that it it's, it's really hard for anyone to access and get testosterone and get, you know, see a doctor and get that kind of side yeah. of stuff done. I think um, it would be fair to say it's not a priority of the NHS at the minute. And furthermore, all of these sort of vaguely controversial programs require... You, you, you've got to put your business case together really very well to say why you're going to benefit people. And if you're going to someone, the commissioners, to say, hey, look, I, I want £100,000 to get a practice, uh, you know, get a nurse and a doctor with an interest in this so that we can go to gyms and we can provide better support for these blokes. I think more so, though, I, I, what I'm trying to get at, at 45, mm. a lot of people at 45, when their testosterone, do, testosterone does go low, yeah. it causes a ripple effect on their well-being, suicide risk, all that type of stuff, because yeah. they get depressed, they get, you know, they, they put on weight, they then in turn get a bad heart because they put on weight, because they are depressed, because they can't get to bed. So I'm, I'm more going down that route than, I know what you're saying, yeah. going to a gym and just giving it to a 30-year-old roid head. Yeah, I'm not saying that. I'm saying more for the clinical side of stuff. It's It would be hard for someone at 45 to, I, don't, I speak to a lot of clients and we, we check our testosterone levels. Sometimes they're really low. And then they go to a doctor and they go, oh, it's in, within range. But it might be only like a point within range. And then they might be, the range is so wide mm -hmm. that they're in between that. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah, probably not your area of expertise though, yeah. huh? <laughs> no, uh, yeah. so, but you know, you know what I'm saying though, don't you? Like yeah. it's, a, it's a very different thing. Wait, wait, if, if, if you know any endocrinologist, mate, point them in our direction. Oh, I'll bring them in. Yeah, yeah, please do. Um, so back to, to the heart. So we, I think, were uh, talking about ejection fraction. Um, one thing that I'm mindful of is that we've mentioned heart attack on a few occasions. Yeah. And I think you've got cardiac arrest, heart attack, I know certainly in the past, I had no clue if what that was the same thing, what the difference is. Yeah. So can you just chat to us a little bit about what a heart attack is and what a cardiac arrest is and what the differences are? Yeah, okay, yeah. So you're sat there and your plaque ruptures. And when your plaque ruptures, you get a blood clot forming on it. And that causes an acute blockage, complete cessation of blood getting to that bit of muscle. And that muscle becomes ischemic okay it starts to die now you've got about an hour and a half to restore the blood flow to that bit of muscle or it will turn to scar so if you don't get it going after 90 minutes that will scar and you'll end up with a degree of heart failure and the degree of heart failure you get depends on how much the muscle was affected you might be very lucky and it was just a small what we call a b road you know like so just a small bit of muscle. But you might be very unlucky, and it might be right at the top of your left coronary artery, which potentially is most of the heart. Now, if that happens, the muscle does not like becoming ischemic. And if it becomes ischemic, it can have an electrical abnormality, which brings me right back to my original analogy when we first started talking, which was the heart being like this room. So you've got the walls, you've got the doors, which are the valves, you've got the electrics now, you haven't got any plumbing because you couldn't even make me a cup of tea at the beginning of this thing but let's assume <laughs> we could it was plumbing, just a pain in the ass <laughs> <laughs> now if you have a problem with the plumbing that's heart attack that's angina 
But as a result of that, the muscle may become very, very unhappy about life or death, and the electrical activation of that bit of muscle may go wrong. And if that happens, you're typically dead in about six to eight seconds. That's how long it'll take. So that's a cardiac arrest. That's it. Six that's to eight heart. seconds. Yeah, I mean that. That's how long it'll take. If, if you go into what we would call VF, so ventricular fibrillation. So if you block an artery and make the muscle ischemic, it won't like it, and there's a decent chance that you'll go into a nasty rhythm disturbance. The people that have just found dead. Mm. Yeah, that's VF, and that's that's six that's to eight a, seconds, and they've that, got. That, well, yeah, and unless so, if if you die, if you happen, if it happened to yeah. you right now, yeah, good CPR. Being fit, so the rest of your body has the, you know, the reserve to cope with it, but ultimately good CPR and eventually an ambulance man or someone with a defibrillator coming in and giving you an electric shock and putting your heart back to normal rhythm, that's what saves your life. But left untreated, you know, you black out after six seconds and ultimately, unless there's anyone around you with the skill set to save you, you're dead. Defibs are so important in there. Yeah, I've got a little statistic here on that, by the way. I might share. I love it. Um, it. So I think 30,000 out-of-hospital cardiac arrests happen each year in the UK. Yeah. And the uh, to add to point, the survival rate is, is less than 1 in 10. Oh, it's, yeah, it, it is less than 10%. It is awful. Yeah. Is there any way to fix that? Education. Oh. So... Uh, public education. <clears throat> well, ultimately, you've, you've got to be found, haven't you? You know, I, I have patients who whose life have been saved because they made a noise upstairs when they had their cardiac arrest, and their relative wondered what on earth had happened, ran upstairs and gave him CPR and called an ambulance. Now, if they if that had happened while they'd been sitting on the bed and they slumped back, they wouldn't have been found; they'd be dead. So, you know, luck. But you have to have a relative. You have to have someone around who knows to get on the chest, do a bit of chest pumps, and call an ambulance really very quickly. Yeah. Okay, I think so, it's first aid, isn't it? Yeah, so yeah. so early CPR is absolutely key then. Oh yeah, yeah, um, and and just from the, 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 I guess the individual who may suffer this fate from their perspective. So we've kind of just just to I just want to make this like a really clear message to people as a bit of a takeaway because we've talked about obviously um, angina, which is like the, the sort of pain, the chest pain, like the um, heart failure. And all these things, to some extent, are a little bit of a sort of a build up to that happening. Yeah. So obviously, when that happens, you've just explained the, the outcome and, and scenario around that. But prior to that happening, are the key watch out things like breathlessness, chest pain, yeah. like what what should people be looking out from, and how they should how should they be reacting to to symptoms to avoid getting to that point? So generally, I would say, look, if you can't walk as far as you could six months ago, and your symptom that prevents you from doing it is worsening shortness of breath or chest pain, or chest, you know, we say pain. As a doctor, I'm always asking chest pain. The patient says, oh, it wasn't really pain so much as a sort of a heavy feeling or like an ache in my chest. You know, we just say chest pain. But it feels like it's a tight feeling, a heavy feeling in the chest. If you're getting any of these symptoms when you're walking around, and in hindsight, you weren't getting them a few months back, that's a warning sign. That, that means that you've probably got an underlying heart condition that's chronic, that's on a sort of a slow burner and that may be left unchecked. You'll get to the age of 100 and get run over by a bus. But it could be a sign that you've got some plaque in your arteries and all it takes is, you know, bad luck, bad news, whatever, for that plaque to rupture. That's what causes the heart attack. And then you're in trouble. Yeah, okay. Um, you mentioned about the electrics and yeah. um, that going obviously haywire and, and not, not playing. I know some people have arrhythmias and, and irregular heartbeats and that type of thing. Yeah. It's maybe to reassure some people, is that is that a risk factor or is that, a, again, like a, a sign of a potential They're, they're not arrest? really risk factors necessarily for ischemic heart disease. So think about them as very different things. You know, if you've got a problem with your plumbing, you need a plumber. If you've got problems with the electrics, you need, you need an electrician. That there is crossover. So a problem with your plumbing, you know, if a house floods, your electrics are going to go dicky. You know, you might die. Whereas rarely does a problem with the electrics then cause a problem with the plumbing. That's, you know, there aren't really many ways that that would happen. So generally speaking, problems with the electrics, so arrhythmia, heart rhythm abnormalities, problems with your pulse rate, that kind of thing, that, that's an entirely different beast. Okay. But really very important. So what, why is that? What? 
the electrics is important to make yeah. sure it's right. So, but well, I'm glad you asked. Yeah, that's what I mean. So wh- wh- why? <laughs> yeah, why is it important? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So generally speaking, problems with the electrics of the heart will cause several issues. Number one, a lot of health-related anxiety. People don't like having palpitations. It really upsets them. You know, if you're you're constantly aware, and, and if you have it, you you're, you become acutely aware of it. And so even if you have just one little extra beat, one little ectopic, that's pretty normal. You tune into it and then your anxiety levels go up, your blood pressure goes up. And then the next time you have one, you go, oh, there, there it was. I'm definitely having them now. Oh, my God, I think I'm going to die here because Uncle Harry died when he was 100 of a heart attack. So that's definitely going to happen to me. Various types of heart rhythm abnormalities can predispo- uh, predispose you to having a stroke. So there's a, a certain particular type of rhythm disturbance that's very, very, very common in this country. Like about 8% of the over 75 population have it. It's called atrial fibrillation. Now the atria, the top two chambers of the heart, and their, their job is to just pump the blood down into the bottom chambers called the ventricles. And the ventricles' job, as you know, is to push the blood around the body or the lungs. Now the atria should just go top, bottom, rest, top bottom rest. That's how the heart should contract. Sometimes if you go into atrial fibrillation, the top chamber starts wobbling away like that. It fibrillates. That's what fibrillation is. Now it's fine if it's on the top chamber, that's okay. What what does it do? It bombards the little distributor cap that sits between the top and the bottom chamber with electrical noise. And if you bombard that little distributor cap with electrical noise, the bottom chamber doesn't know what on earth to do. So it starts contracting but really erratically. It's like having a badly tuned radio. It's just that white shh noise. Sometimes it'll cause an activation, sometimes it won't. So your pulse rate may go really, really fast, up to 200, 210 beats a minute. It might go really slowly down to 30 or, you know, 25 or 30. It might swing between the two. They're the really annoying ones to treat because if you give them a tablet to make stop it going too fast, it'll make the slow even worse. Now they keep falling over. So that's atrial fibrillation. But why is it a problem? Well, obviously no one wants a a pulse rate that's irregular, that's swinging around. But the real danger in it is what happens to the blood in this top chamber. There's a wee little windsock called the appendage that comes off the left atrium. And that windsock should close like that every time the heart contracts and it should push all the blood out. But if it's fibrillating, you get blood stasis. That just means that the blood stays still in there. And the bit right down at the apex doesn't move at all. And what does blood do when it stays still? It turns into a clot. And if you get a blood clot down in there, it doesn't matter so much. But if it flies off, which it will do probably, it'll ping off. And then you've got a blood clot in systemic circulation. Why don't you want a blood clot in systemic circulation? Because it whizzes out of the heart and the first place it shoots up is into your head. And that causes a stroke. It's one of the leading causes of stroke in this country is undiagnosed atrial fibrillation. Tiny little blood clots forming in the heart, pinging off, going north and getting stuck in the brain. That's a, that's a stroke and it can be devastating. You know, you can have a very, very big stroke as a result of this. So diagnosing atrial fibrillation and taking preventative action, getting someone on the appropriate blood thinner to protect them from the blood clots, to protect them from the stroke is of paramount importance. And every year there's a big drive to try and improve a patient's awareness of this sort of thing. So what with that, what are the main, is it the same sort of um, problems that like of a regular heart attack or is it something else that they got to look out for? Well, as, as I said before, a, a heart attack, it's a problem with the plumbing. So if, from, a, from a symptom point of view? From a symptom point of view, irregular pulse. So, but not everybody will aware of that. You know, not everybody obsesses around feeling their pulse or feeling palpitations. Yeah, and sorry, when you say a regular pulse, are we talking like skipping a beat or are we talking like tachycardia where it's over 100? Uh, Well, no. How do you define a regular heartbeat for people? Feel your pulse. If if you can feel your pulse, you can feel it in your wrist, you can feel it in your elbow, you can feel it in your neck. Yeah, just a rest, yeah. If you feel it, if you can tap it out nice and regular and you can tap your foot to it, that's normal, Okay. If it's jazz, if it's chaotic, that's irregular. Right. And if you feel your pulse and it feels that you can't tap it out, or what people would say is misbeats or extra beats, is very often atrial fibrillation, uh, you should go to your GP and you should get an ECG done to diagnose it. Yeah. And you mentioned about sort of the heart rate speeding up and down. So sort of tachycardia is, is sort of a high and bradycardia I think is low. Um, 
that wouldn't be necessarily a regular. That would just be fast or really slow. It, it can be completely chaotic. So sometimes okay. it, it then comes down to the fact that electrically it could be very fast, but sometimes it's so fast that it doesn't actually produce a meaningful pulse. So you feel your pulse and you go, oh, it's really slow. Mm. Yeah, I was only 30 beats a minute, but we do an ECG and it's yeah. at 100. It's like a That's because it's going so fast <laughs> that sometimes the heart hasn't had time to fill up with blood enough so that when it next contracts, it doesn't actually produce a pulse. So really the only way to formally diagnose it is, is with an ECG. Or if you're one of those lucky people that's got an iPhone or, or an iWatch rather, uh, you know, they'll give you diagnostic quality ECGs on them. Yeah. So with that though, if you went, if you if you found that, are you can you could just go to your GP and just say, look, I think I've got an irregular heartbeat. Yeah, and definitely. Refer, and would they would they have to refer you? Well, they do they you... they do an ECG uh, and diagnose it, and then really depending on what your symptoms are like and what the skill set of the GP is, they may refer you to a cardiologist for further investigations, or they may say, look, actually, let's just put you on a blood thinner, give you a bit of a beta blocker to slow your heart down and see how you do, and that'll be perfectly reasonable as well. Yeah. Yeah, so it's not always, you know, you, you're not always needed in that sort of situation. Yeah, yeah, it could be yeah, yeah. I'd be very busy if I saw everyone with AF. <laughs> <laughs> Would you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is it that common? Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, like I say, 8% 8, 8 of people over the age of 75. Yeah, well, that's a lot, isn't it, really? <laughs> yeah. 8%. 8 yeah, this reminds me of something that Will said, actually, the GP was on uh, weeks ago. Mm -hmm. so he said one of the risk factors for men, I think, was that they just don't seek help. And this is, yeah, I guess a message to any men listening that if you are experiencing any of this, then yeah, go and chat to your GP. AF's a really important one. Yeah. I mean, it's really easy to to just to do the basic scoring system. You know, it's one visit to your GP, get an ECG, and if you've got AF, um, you know, if you're not symptomatic, they'll just put you on the blood thinner, and that's fine. And then you can forget about it, but you're safe, and you know you're not going to have a stroke. Yeah, yeah okay. Um, I think we've cut off most of the main ones, right? I'm impressed. Well done. Thanks. What, for heart rhythms? Um, well, I think just the sort of heart diseases. Um, one one thing that I do want to ask about, and then we'll maybe circle back to some of your, your sort of um, dirty stats there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't bring any dirty stats. <laughs> um, was sudden cardiac death. Yeah. Because, you know, certainly anybody who watches football will remember, maybe remember Mark Vivian Foe. So he was a prime example. Foe. Foe. My apologies. Oh, sorry. Um, I'm, but I'm embarrassed on your behalf. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, we can add it out. It's fine. <laughs> yeah. He doesn't like football. It's fine. Yeah, I'm, I'm a fight fan, mate. Um, Christian Eriksen more recently. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, of course. Yeah, he survived, though, right? Yeah, yeah. He yeah, plays yeah, manager. He plays sides. Yeah, yeah um, CPR. But you, you hear about it all the time, these, these fit people running marathons and all sorts and then dropping dead. What, what yeah. is, what's happening there? What's that? Yeah, okay. So there, there are two main ways to look at it you've got problems with the structure of the heart so again bringing it back to this room analogy it's problems with the the wall or the valves or you've got problems with the electrics let's look at them both separately structure of the heart there's this condition called hypertrophic cardiomyopathy now that's not the sort of hypertrophy you get from abusing the steroids or having high blood pressure in the long term this is a, a genetic predisposition to having abnormal growth of the muscle now if that muscle gets thickened, um, it doesn't relax very well, so you end up with a heart failure type syndrome. But also within that muscle, you can get little islands of scar. There's, there's lots of healthy muscle tissue, but interspersed between it is scar tissue. And scar tissue in heart muscle is a bad thing to have because it's the scar tissue that upsets the electrics of the heart, okay? So if you have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, you are more likely than your average Joe Bloggs on the street to have a sudden, unexpected heart rhythm abnormality and not the sort of heart rhythm abnormality that may cause a stroke like atrial fibrillation or some that just cause people palpitations. Mm -hmm. If you have a heart rhythm abnormality that affects the bottom chamber of the heart, you, you know, you're gone, as I say, within a few seconds. Oh, you know, you know, you've seen the video of Ericsson, let's just stand there and down he goes. That, that, that's all it takes. The difference between having a, a rhythm disturbance in between six and eight seconds is, you know, blacking out. And So is there any symptoms that he may have got or people get before that kind of thing happens because you, you like you said you find that they're really fit people you know they have no prior history so a lot of and then, a, a, boom they're yeah, gone yeah a lot of young people especially if they're serious about you sport overwork your heart will have uh, you can and there is this condition called athlete's heart and when we see people with athlete's heart uh, 
part of the job is to try and tease out whether it's hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which is bad, or whether it's athlete's heart, which is sometimes okay. But they can both mimic each other. You know, on lots of imaging and electrically, they behave very similarly. So trying to work out whether one is just, you know, normal because they've overtrained and the other one is potentially a life-threatening condition, sometimes you actually have to tell the patient to ease off a little bit for six months and then rescan and see what the heart does in response to that. That's what I was going to say. So with the athlete's heart, if they do knock it back, will improve. it will improve. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it will just go yeah. back to normal. And, and, and there's less evidence to say that people with athlete's heart are more predisposed to having heart rhythm abnormalities. So it's a, it, it's a very different beast to genuine hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in this country is really common. It's one in 500 in this country. That That's really common. You know, I see a lot of people with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, one of the things they're predisposed to is sudden cardiac death as a result of scarring on the heart. But hope for the vast majority of them, they've actually had symptoms long before that because they get this heart failure syndrome. So their exercise tolerance is reduced, these sorts of things. But generally speaking, it's something that will be diagnosed with, you know, certainly for an, uh, 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 a, uh, an elite sportsman or woman would have been through a screening process and they'd have had an ECG and they'd that's have probably had an say, echo. How, how did that not pick up? For well, like, that's like only the Eric's structural. Are so so I'm, I'm, I'm not sure he had Oakham. I don't think he did. Um, that's that's the structural side. Now, that's the one that gets people who aren't elite, you know, you, okay. you, your club sports person. He's, yeah, the that, Sunday uh, league player. predisposed Sunday to league getting player, that yeah. because they, you know, they, they haven't got twenty thousand pound you know yeah. sponsorship deals and they're not getting the the medical support that you know that the high class people would get electrical abnormalities though you can't see them you you know you do an ultrasound scan of the heart the heart looks completely plumb normal you put them on a treadmill and um, look at the heart electrically while they're hoofing it and their heart looks completely normal but occasionally there can be changes in the electrical activation or really in the in the really small nitty-gritty cellular structure of the heart that causes abnormalities and how the electricity flows over the heart. And there's several different of these uh, the types of conditions, all of which can cause sudden cardiac death. You can cause a young, otherwise very fit and healthy person to just bang, drop down dead. And unless there's, as I say, someone with the appropriate skill set and a defibrillator nearby, uh, they're in trouble. It's absolutely fucking scary, though. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? The way you say that, then you think, fucking hell. Yeah. Like, you could just... You never know, do you? I mean, it's ridiculously rare. Oh, yeah, but, of course. But the yeah. thing is, you can't yeah. you can't really screen for some of these conditions. You know, there are organisations out there that do screening. Uh, that You know, they just go to local sports centres. And I've seen people as a result of that. You know, they've, they've gone, had the screening done, and they've been found to have an abnormality on their, just their ECG, and then they get referred in to me for uh, for work up for that it's mad isn't it though? yeah mad crazy um and then just think some of the intervention so we talked already about the uh, the stents and talked yeah. about the medication one thing we've not talked about and you've you've kind of alluded to it a couple of times but obviously is open heart surgery and bypass surgery mm -hmm. so just wh when would that be needed and what is that exactly yeah okay so generally speaking th there's your heart you've got three arteries that sit on the outside of the heart now if you if you cause a blockage right up here at the beginning of these two arteries at the common origin, it's called the left main stem, okay? If you have an, a narrowing there and you damage that narrowing and it pops, then all of that bit of the muscle downstream is going to be starved and you will die. There is, you know, that you're, you're a goner if you block your left main. You can't live. If you, if you have a bit of narrowing right down here, on this artery, then it's only that little bit of muscle downstream there that's potentially at risk. And so even if it blocks off, you'd have a bit of scar, but you'd live to tell the tale. You might have something to talk about in the pub. And medical therapy to prevent all the other narrowings from getting worse. Now, let's say you present with angina. You're getting tight in the chest when you're walking out and it's cold and you're taking the dog for a walk. And actually, in hindsight, six months ago, you used to be able to do this dog fine, this walk fine. And now your dog's hoofing off ahead of you and you can't keep up because you're getting a tight feeling in the chest. And you go to your GP and they give you some pills and then you get to refer to a cardiologist. And you'd probably get a test. You'd probably get a CT scan of your coronary arteries. A CT scan, we just put contrast agent in your arm and then take a CT picture of the arteries. 
And you might see that actually you've got widespread disease in all three of those arteries. Well, you've got some options, haven't you? Option number one, put loads of stents in. Have lots and lots of them. And the problem with stents is they're metal, they're man-made, and they can actually cause blood clots to form on them. So putting, putting metalwork in, generally not a good thing. You don't really want to be putting metalwork into anywhere in the body because it can go wrong. And it's scary as fuck to put in. Nah, <laughs> it's fascinating. I, I think they generally quite enjoy doing it, but you know, that, that's an entirely different topic. My, my dad had some stents, and he was he was yeah he was in, in his element watching it being done on the screen. In a way, we won't interrupt. Carry yeah, on. that's fine. Now, if your option is loads and loads of stents, or the other option is bypass surgery. Now, what bypass surgery does is essentially it bypasses the narrowing. So, if the narrowing is where my knuckle is here, here, and here, you get an entirely new blood vessel, plumb it into the aorta that comes out up here, and wrap it round and just sew it in downstream. So you're bypassing the narrowing there. And you would typically have, you know, people brag, they say I've had a triple or a quadruple. Those are that that's just how many grafts you have. So you've got three main arteries. So if you've got disease in all three of those, you'd end up with all three of them grafted. This one down here has a big side branch called a diagonal. And sometimes that can be a very big side branch and very important. So you'd put a graft on that one as well. And that's just the difference between, you know, a quadruple and a, a triple. You know, the surgeon will just see what's disease when he's in there and basically graft where you can get a graft onto ultimately. But those are, that, that's generally speaking. That, so that will be done by a, a cardiothoracic surgeon because it involves a big scar, stopping the heart for a while and putting grafts on, whereas stents are all done by a cardiologist uh, which is just a little bit of local anaesthetic in the wrist, you know, and takes, you know, well, you know, one stent takes about 35, 40 minutes. Lots of stents would take two and a half hours. And where do the, where do the grafts come from? Um, your main one is uh, what we call a lemur, which uh, is uh, the left internal mammary artery. That's an artery that runs down the side of the chest wall and supplies the chest wall here. Now, you don't actually need a blood supply to your chest wall. There's plenty of other blood vessels that go there. So that's a really nice, reliable one. So you just disconnect it from the bottom, put some clips on it, and plumb it onto the heart instead. Uh, most people would have a lemur. Uh, <laughs> and then you'll often see these people have got big scars coming up their legs. Mm -hmm. So what they do is they, they take the saphenous vein, which is just one of the big veins in your legs, uh, take the vein, strip it inside out, and then plumb that in, and they just use that as sort of the conduit, just the new piping. So you'll normally end up with a lemur and two vein grafts. That would be your sort of your bog standard bypassed operation. What, so you, sorry, I didn't ever know that. <laughs> I didn't ever know they use your own. I, I don't know what I assumed, to be honest with you. But <laughs> again, that's that's absolutely mental, isn't it? Yeah, like that's it. really cool. Yeah, like that they take it out of your leg and then put it in your in your heart. Yeah, it's, it's really it's fascinating. Turn it inside out. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's good fun to watch. Certainly, yeah. <gasps> and and when when we say open heart surgery, is literally that, isn't it? They cut the sternum in half and open you up. The, the, the sternum is opened. Uh, the the heart is directly visualised as they would say, and then they, they stop the heart. So they put you onto a bypass machine, right. but you can't, well, you can operate on the beating heart, but it gets very messy and there, there are only certain procedures that you can do with that. So generally speaking, you have to stop the heart, but you can't stop the heart because the patient will die. So you, there's a big machine called a bypass machine that will just keep the heart doing its thing or just does the heart's job for them temporarily. Uh, usually buys you half an hour or so while you get on and do the grafts or you know replace the valve if that's what the what the surgeon uh, needs to do yeah. and then once they're finished putting the grafts on make sure there's no bleeding and restart the heart yeah wow and finally uh pacemakers yeah um so we uh, we've touched on obviously the the electrics a little bit um pacemaker obviously plays a part in controlling that yeah so what, what, what does that... So, so generally speaking, there are, there are three main types of pacemaker that you would consider. Your average bog standard pacemaker is there to speed the heart up if the heart goes too slowly. That's all it does. You can't prevent things like atrial fibrillation from having a pacemaker put in. But if you're on one of those unlucky people who have AF and their heart goes really high and then really low and then really high again, that's really annoying. But you can't give them a tablet to stop it going too fast because they'll go really slow and fall over. You can put a pacemaker in to stop them going too low and then give them a beta blocker tablet to stop them going too fast. That's sort of a belt and braces approach to AF. 
Um, there are th th there's these two little distributor caps that you think about in the heart that control the timing of the heart. And as you get older, they get a bit diseased and they can uh, misbehave. And some of the impulses will get missed from going from the top of the heart down to the bottom. And if you miss one or two, that's not so bad. But if you miss four or five in a row, you'll black out because the bottom chamber doesn't contract uh, and down you go. So having a pacemaker put in for those reasons, that's yeah, probably about 80% of the pacemakers I put in are put in just to speed up a, an, an aging heart, basically. Then you've got uh, pacemakers that are good to treat people with heart failure. Now picture it like this, if you're standing on a, uh, on a beach and you've got an ice cream cone in your hand, okay, and that ice cream cone in this analogy is your left ventricle. Now the pointy bit on the bottom of the ice cream cone is where the electricity should come out and it should flow up both sides of the heart simultaneously so that when you view the heart like that, it should contract like that, okay? Now if the electrics are failing and if the heart is failing, the electricity won't come out from the pointy bit down the bottom. It'll come out from, let's say, where your thumbnail is, and it'll wrap around the side of the heart, round like that. What that means is that the heart will, this side of the heart will contract before that side of the heart. So it'll go like that instead of like that. And if it goes like that, it spends quite a lot of its energy swooshing blood around in the heart rather than pushing it around the body. Now, if I induce that electrical abnormality in you, you wouldn't know about it because you've got loads and loads of reserve, you know, if you've got an ejection fraction of 60%, you might drop it down to 55%. You wouldn't know about that. But if you're at 35%, or if you're at 30%, and I drop it down to 25% by inducing this, what we call dyssynchrony, that's the difference between you being able to walk up a flight of stairs in one go, or having to stop halfway up for a breather. You know, that's potentially the difference between being able to lie down flat at night to have a good night's sleep or having to sleep in an armchair you know it's the difference between whether you can go and make your own cup of tea or whether you have to get your wife to do it but that comes down to you know personality perhaps for some people <laughs> so what you can do is put a pacemaker wire on this side of the heart and this side of the heart and make both of those walls contract simultaneously again that's a, a device called a cardiac resynchronization device and it's a very good treatment for people with certain electrical abnormalities and heart failure and it's a, it's a procedure that I spend a lot of my time doing. Then your third type of pacemaker or cardiac device is a defibrillator. And that really brings us back to people that have either survived a cardiac arrest. So if you, if you have a cardiac arrest, you may well come to me to then have a discussion about having a defibrillator implanted inside you. So these things that are on, you know, church walls, down at the village hall, that kind of thing in, in a box, you can get really small versions of it that we can implant inside the body and that will detect an electrical abnormality, a life-threatening electrical abnormality, and giving you an electric shock to get you out of it and it'll do it within about 12 seconds and you know, it will save your life. So, uh, you know, various people with heart failure, people with certain types of heart, you know, previous heart attacks, some genetic abnormalities, they'll have defibrillators implanted. That's mad. I didn't. I didn't even know they they had internal defibrillators. Mm. Yeah, don't know that. That's really cool. Yeah, yeah I like them. Yeah, that's yeah. really cool. Like, yeah, <laughs> do you know what I mean? they're like, pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why are they like with things like um, uh, like heart rate monitors and and airport like metal detectors? Yeah. Did, did it? So, so, so they have a little card. Yeah. There, there's today. four or five. Yeah. There, there's four or five different companies in the world that make these things. Right. So it doesn't matter where you end up in the world. If you if you have one of these devices, there's going to be someone around that can interrogate the thing for you. Um, but you will get a an ID card. It'll have your name. And it'll have the you know the serial number of the device that you have. It, it's not so much that you'll set the alarm off. You know, it doesn't matter. You know, you see, you go through. You set the alarm off. You hold your card up. That's fine. But the thing that people sometimes worry about is these airport scanners. Uh, work by producing electrical uh, fields and if you have a wire and you induce a magnetic field around that wire you produce electricity on the line of that wire and if you produce electricity along that wire then the device might see that electricity and it might see it as white noise it might see it as noise but it will detect it as a heart rhythm abnormality and the worst case scenario is that it will think that your life is at risk and it'll deliver you a shock when you didn't actually need the shock. What will that do to them? Nothing? 
Well, it bloody hurts. <laughs> <laughs> At the very least. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a, they say it's like being kicked in the chest by a very, very big horse. Wow. I mean, it's over in a, in a fraction of a second. And it can... Not to floor it, you, though, huh? It, oh, it'll floor you, yeah. yeah. And it can be dangerous if you're very unlucky. But it's just really very, very unpleasant. You know, we, we have people who have to have counselling after that. Counselling? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's a proper big traumatic event. You know, you're minding your own business and all of a sudden you get a... You know, so your TV remote, 3 volts, mains, 240 volts. The defibrillators I put in are 800 volts. Oh, yeah, I mean, you know, so it's a large amount of electricity. big uh, shock, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's a big <laughs> shock. I mean, they do their job, but it really hurts if they go off. Does it have to be that big to, for it to work, I imagine? That's yeah, I mean, you you need a certain amount of energy being delivered to the heart in one big go. So most of the, most of the device is just battery and capacitor. Charge, 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 wallop. Fucking <laughs> hell. Look after your heart, people. Because yeah. Uh, yeah, you don't want these yeah, things. Yeah, 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 crazy. Um, just, just to kind of finish up a little bit. Um, we we talked earlier about the risk factors, and I think most people know the risk factors, right? And you, you already kind of listed them all off. Yeah. Um, did want to just talk if we've got time um, about cardiac rehabilitation, specifically around obviously your your uh, publication mm. um, and what that concluded as well. Have you got time to run through that real quick, mate? Yeah, yeah. Well, so the one that I. Uh, uh, co-authored a, a long, long time ago now was the Cochrane Review for uh, Cardiac Rehabilitation. Now, what, what a Cochrane Review actually is, is it's a way of getting, look, as, as I alluded to, you know, a, a decent randomized control tile costs a ridiculously large amount of money. So in order to get really, really good information, to really be very, very confident about what you're talking about in, in medicine or in any uh, scientific field, you need to throw money at the problem. Things like cardiac rehabilitation are never going to have a large amount of money thrown at it, just not, not the sorts of sums that we're talking about. But what you do have is lots of small-scale trials going on. So you've got you know interested physios in a single centre who have looked at 120 people and put through their cardiac rehab programme or that, you know, they've got 120 that have gone through the rehab program and 100 people who haven't. And they've looked at, you know, in six months time, how far can one group walk compared to the other? Or what's the average blood pressure of one group versus the other? Or how far, you know, what would they classify their quality of life as being? But ultimately, that sort of data there is small scale and isn't great quality. By great quality, I mean scientifically not great quality because there's so much bias built into it. You know, the physios want their program to be a success, so they're biased against proving that these guys do better. So maybe they give them a backhander and they feed them carrots when they <laughs> give the other guys chips. You know, these are, I don't think, silly to prove a point, but there's lots of bias built into all this sort of stuff. So in order to really do a good trial, the people who are delivering the, the treatment should be blinded against it. Now, you can't do that with cardiac rehab because you can't, you can't deliver cardiac rehab, but also be blinded as to whether you're doing it because you're clearly just doing it or you're not doing it. You know, that's silly. But ultimately, you know, the quality of the evidence is weaker as a result of that. But in order to combat against that and the fact that it's only ever relatively small scale trials, that there are two big ones that came out more recently. Uh, what you do is you do a meta-analysis and a meta-analysis a st sort of a statistical fudge of getting all of these pieces of information, gluing them together, sticking them all in one big bucket, mixing them up, and then drawing conclusions from that big weight of, of evidence there. And if done correctly, and Cochrane is exceedingly rigorous in the way they report it, and they will report not only the findings, but also quality of data, quality of bias. So Cochrane's a company. Uh, yeah, it's a it, it's an institution. Yeah, it, it, it's not so much a company. Yeah, uh, but the, the, their evidence is very very highly thought of because they're exceedingly rigorous in in the way they produce that evidence. But ultimately, Cochrane reviews are, are are a form of scientific publication called a meta analysis, and a meta analysis is just a way of getting lots of data, gluing it together, and trying to draw a stronger conclusion from that. So the the actual findings and the conclusion then of your well for heart failure analysis, what um, you, find? you know we'd want it to be better quite <laughs> frankly we, we we would have liked uh to be able to say to our patients you're going to live longer 
if you do a rehab program and you have heart failure. But you can't say that. You can say that there's a trend towards that. But again, the evidence just wasn't strong enough to actually draw that conclusion. But do you feel better while you're living? Yeah. I mean, the evidence is certainly that your quality of life, that, you know, the quality of life scoring system, of which there's lots of different ones, all said that your quality of life goes up significantly if you have heart failure and you do a rehab program. There is a trend towards less hospitalizations as a, reduce, as a result of heart failure. So these are all big pluses. You know, you want all of these things. You want to live longer, being in hospital less, and you want to live, uh, you want to feel better while you're living. So those are all positives. But that's for the heart failure population. For ischemic heart disease, so problems with the plumbing, the evidence is even better. The evidence does actually say that you will live longer. You, you have less chance of dying, not just from heart failure or ischemic heart disease, but all-cause mortality. You're less likely to die young if you do rehab, after, if you've got ischemic heart disease. So that's, that's ridiculously powerful. Mm. Yeah, and, and cardiac rehabilitation, that's primarily based around building cardiovascular fitness. Yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah um, cardiovascular fitness, you know, core muscle strength and just giving your body the resilience to be able to cope with you know the, the rest of the illness that you have i bring you back to the laborer with 10 percent. you know so what impact though does that report have on what we actually do you know what i mean so does that that those findings so they then take that and then look at that and make changes according to that or is it just kind of does it kind of just out there and then we talked already about i guess the varying levels in, in quality of cardiac rehabilitation programs out there but i guess it would a good one would use that type of information to inform what they're doing right it comes down to local interest it comes down to local expertise it comes down to funding so what the the, the commissioners the, the commissioners the people with the money and then the hospitals and the gps go to the commissioners saying hey we want to do this program uh, we think it's going to you know, save this many lives or produce this much quality of life improvement and it's going to cost you two and a half thousand pounds a year, uh, are you going to buy it? And they say yes or no. And that's kind of how local services are commissioned. That's, that's, that's how it works. But it takes a lot of work right at the beginning and some interest to actually write the business case to go to the commissioners to get the service set up. So the, the, the NHS in that respect is a very, very clunky machine you know most of your listeners will probably just think that this is all just done centrally and centrally they say right you should do this you should do this go go off and do that ah, that's not how it works I, I thought that's exactly how it worked i thought no. it was done by some some geezer up in london <laughs> who decided basically as an overall of what what goes on and then it's rolled out you know so, like, so like, a, like a like a business do you so know they're, I mean? like they're, a, they're like, trying to do that so there's the, there was this big drive what the, the ongoing big drive called GERFT, which stands for get it right first time and what get it right first time it basically means is it's going around looking at what is what does best practice look like going to every center in the uk and saying right what do you do for this and, and what your outcomes and oh that's that's good actually that that works really well what do you do oh that's not so good your outcomes for that are terrible you don't even provide that service well that's awful then they go away and they write a big report and say actually these are your gold standards you ought to be doing this you ought to be doing this you ought to be doing this you shouldn't be doing this and then it's then up to the the individual centers to get that report and try and follow it and there are certain financial uh you know triggers to get you to be compliant with so it. a lot of this stuff is doctor driven yeah if that makes sense but yeah. if if you have a group of doctors in a certain area that really don't give a fuck about rehab in in the heart yeah that that's just that's just done then that's just not even well obviously with i just find that fucking well mental. i know with nuffield health who are obviously a, a, a sort of piloting cardiac rehabilitation program which is free of charge and the their ability but how many people would know about that well, do you get what I mean? Like, if they, if they come to see, but they're actively working with some of the local trusts to try and integrate these services, and are hitting multiple barriers. But that shouldn't be Nuffield's job. But they're a charity, so that's that is, is their job. <laughs> but that should be but, coming from the NHS, so shouldn't it? But my point is, is that you've got some pockets, some some clinicians who are massively in favour and will support it, and and do what they can to drive it through. But there's there's other areas of the country that are just. Just for whatever reason, I put in the blockers up and, and just I just find that yeah. Again, it's like we should be providing that as a nation as a service, surely. Yeah, you but, know what I mean, and mm. I just find it absolutely but, crazy. Well, I think we talked at the very beginning that I think it's 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 money and priority, isn't it? And that's where charities are. But health should always come over money, surely. 
but it's it's but it's 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 the different where yeah, what's what aspect yeah. of health is more important, isn't it? Ultimately, if you said right, you've got a hundred thousand pounds, and we can you know the cancer team need a new radiation machine, uh, or we can fund some cardiac rehab. Uh, you know, you're clearly going to give it to the cancer guys. Yeah, but then, yeah, it's it's, it's the which way they're going to die, though, isn't it? It's like, it, you know what I mean? But like, I think with the cardiac rehab, they've had an intervention, so they've had the heart revascularized or whatever's happened, so they're, they're safe for the minute. Maybe their quality of life <laughs> or... I know what you're saying. Yeah. I understand. I'm, I'm, I'm not I, disagreeing. I, I understand it, it is all. It is, right? I understand exactly what you're saying, but I find it still absolutely crazy that it's it's like, oh, we've got a, this this chunk of money for example, and then we've got to choose who we want to save or who we think is more likely to die fast or needs the treatment more urgently. But they're probably on the scale of things most, just as important because, uh, you know, as many men probably die, I don't know exactly, but as die of like heart failure and stuff like that, even though you're treating them, as soon as they go away, if they go back into those old habits and those old ways without really the the rehabilitation that your, you know, your, your Cochrane paper has, has said that, helps people hmm. they're not they're not really getting the they're, they're getting a short-term fix and then they're getting nothing else is that right no? yeah for some people yeah 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 that's, that's what right, yeah. yeah all right just yeah just find it fucking mental. Yeah. <laughs> just can't believe it yeah. um any any last advice um from sort of lifestyle choices for the yeah audience? my old boss said if it walks on four legs don't eat it that was his advice okay yeah, that, that was his kind of rehab uh and I, and I quite liked it actually really so, you know, white meat, good, Mediterranean diet, good, you know, a bit of steak every now and again is absolutely fine, but try and lay off the bacon sarnies every day, that's not going to do you any good. But I'd say it's the first cigarette of the day that kills you. So smoking one cigarette a day, mm, that's not good. Yeah, one cigarette is going to make your blood very sticky for quite a lot of the day. So that it's the first cigarette of the day that's going to kill you, not the 20th. So knocking it down... That's nice. It tells me that you're motivated to try and improve and being motivated is 90% of the battle, but you need to knock it on the head completely. Uh, and if anybody ever gives you an, an offering to have your blood pressure checked, take it up. And if it's elevated, take it seriously, especially if you're young. Of course, nobody likes taking tablets when they're young, but it's like a life insurance policy. You don't want to be 40 with high blood pressure untreated because when you get to 60, and it creeps up on you really quickly, um, that's when you're going to be in trouble. That's mm -hmm. when you're going to be starting to develop these consequences. And your blood pressure gets very difficult to treat then. So take it seriously when you're young, if if it happens to you. Amazing. Brilliant. Brilliant. Dr. Davies, thank you very much. Oh, thank, thank you. you very much, fun. mate. Great. Good. Perfect. Thank you. All right.